Have you been watching the news about Afghanistan and everything else going on in the world today? But about Afghanistan, as I give this and prepare it, what's the date today? I think the 25th, is it today? 20, yeah, 25th of August, 2021. What a colossal, shameful blunder of incompetence. As I speak on this, we don't know yet what happens on August 31st or between now and then or right after then. It won't be good. It's already been horrible. All I can hope and pray for is that there won't be a lot of bloodshed, but it sure is not looking good. But even if there's not, it's already been horrible. It's already been a debacle. Welcome. Welcome to Light on the Rock, all of you children of the house of God and of our Father in heaven, of Yeshua, the light and the rock, where I get the name Light on the Rock. I'm Philip Shields, the host of Light on the Rock. I want to start with Leviticus 26, verses 18 and 19. Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 are parallel chapters that are called the cursings or the blessings and cursings chapter. If you obey me in the Old Testament to the nation of Israel, if you obey me, I will bless you immensely. If you don't obey me, I will curse you immensely. And you need to read those two chapters. Please do. The cursings are not very fun to read, but you'll start to understand what's happening in the world today when you read those chapters and hear what I'm about to say here as a pro log to many more sermons coming about where America and Britain and France and the, the Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, Switzerland, all these countries in the northwestern part of Europe are mentioned in the Bible, uh, except by different names. Leviticus 26, verse 18 and 19, and, and the cursings part of it, after all this, if you do not obey me, I will punish you seven times more for your sins. I will break the pride of your power. I, God says, this is God, these are God's words. I will break the pride of your power. Now you've got to know that America right now is the world's superpower. And we're very proud of our F-18s and our F-22s and F-35s and aircraft carriers and bases all around the world and our SEAL teams and our army and our wealth and our power and our size. A lot of Americans have pride in that. God says, because you've broken my ways, my, my laws, because of your sins, I'm going to break your pride of your power. Did you know that verse was even in there in the Bible? With the stain seared to our nation's soul, caused by some very cowardly and poor decisions on Afghanistan, Afghanistan, we need to hear about this and what God prophesied. I believe the events in Afghanistan are going to have far, far deeper, longer-reaching consequences, both to our standing in the world and to the door being opened wide for terrorism within our own country as we've never seen it before. Al-Qaeda will now have a country to work from and not fear that we will go back in. I really doubt it under this president especially. I believe before all this is done, this is going to be far worse than the way we got out of Vietnam and the Saigon Embassy. I'm almost 70. I remember all these things. I watch these things. It's going to be worse than the Cuban Bay of Pigs debacle under President Kennedy. In my lifetime, I haven't seen such decisions imperiling the lives of thousands of Americans. We don't know the end of the story yet. Pray for them. Pray for them. Europeans, Afghans, who helped us in the past 20 years. By the way, 50,000 Afghan soldiers have died in the past 20 years fighting for their country. So their girls can go to school. So their women can go outside and, and, and shop and, be a, and, and, and go to work and be on radio, on TV. What have we come to? What have we come to? And look at how open our southern border is. I mean, people are just walking over by the hundreds of thousands. And they're finding MS-13 gang members coming along into America, just walking on over, many of them with COVID-19, not being 
uh, tested or quarantined for the most part, being put on buses and airplanes and shipped all over America without quarantining, without shots, with COVID-19, many of them, not all of them. But if they can do it, surely Al-Qaeda and ISIS or anyone can do it. So we'll talk about that today because I think you're gonna, you and I have some things to be getting into a order in our lives and get prepared for some very rough days and years ahead. We need to be getting our relationship with God Almighty so that he does, I think it's in Ezekiel 9, it's not in my notes, but I believe it's in Ezekiel 9 where God says, go and put a mark to his angels. He says, go and put a mark on the people, the men and women of, of uh, his people who sigh and cry for the abominations in the land and they won't be killed. All the others were killed. There's going to be a coming mark of the beast. We don't want the mark of the beast in Revelation. We want God's mark on our foreheads so that when the time of punishments really start to happen, angels and others will see who have protection from God. And even then, some of them, some of us, may be called to die for our beliefs. And if so, hallelujah, my Savior died for me. I certainly can die for him. I want to be able to say that with his help and power. I'm a scaredy cat like anybody else. But if it comes to that, we must. Our allies are heaping scorn on America right now. I believe NATO and Europe will turn against America, build up their own armies, make their own decisions, and eventually cast off America and be part of its total destruction someday. Yes, that's what I said. Total destruction of America. Surely our powerful allies in Europe must be wondering if our president couldn't stand up to a bunch of thugs in Afghanistan called the Taliban. How would he ever stand up to China if they start invading Taiwan, which they will do? And they probably have moved that timetable up quite a bit sooner, seeing how he caved to the ragtag bunch of thugs in, in Afghanistan. He's not going to stand up to Russia and China. <clears throat> Realize we gave the Taliban $85 billion worth of war gear. I heard my numbers correct, 600,000 rifles, AR-15s and ammo. Our mortars, missiles, helicopters, our, our armored vehicles. Oh my word, what have we done? We've made them one of the strongest, in terms of equipment anyway, powerhouses in, the, in Asia, uh, except for China. Was this foretold in the Bible? I'm going to tell you, yes, it was. But not in the specifics of what we're watching in, Af in Afghanistan. But yes, it was foretold that we would have some things happen where we would lose the power, the pride of our power. America and Britain and so much more are mentioned in the Bible, just under the old names. Much is said about America and the world in the Bible. Is it possible, can you at all possibly consider, that God will use the names Ethiopia, Egypt, Persia, which is Iran, and other countries name by name that we know of today in the Bible, but not mention America, United States, Britain, France, Russia, China? Of course he mentions them, but just under different names. So I believe the House of Israel is America and Britain and, and Northwestern Europe, uh, but primarily North, uh, America and Britain, though the sons, of, uh, through the sons of Joseph, and I'll explain more as we go along. We've been heading and writing um, and leading Europe for the past 76 years, but I believe that within the coming seven to nine years, you're going to see them reject us and Europe will no longer trust us and may even have a big hand in destroying America and Britain. Israel was originally Jacob. They have Abraham, Isaac, then Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. Esau became what is mostly the uh, Arab, uh, Islamic countries, Arab countries in particular, uh, not all Islamic countries are Arab, like Indonesia, Persia, and so on, yeah, Iran. But anyway, uh, Israel, and Jacob was renamed Israel. He had 12 sons who became 12 tribes of Israel. 
under Saul, then David, then King Solomon. And But in the reign of Solomon's son, Rehoboam, the northern ten tribes, headed by Ephraim, one of Joseph's two sons, rebelled and became the house of Israel. The house of Israel was not Judah at this point, from this point on. Judah, the Jews, and Levi and Benjamin formed the southern kingdom of the house of Judah. So you have the house of Israel with the ten tribes in the north part of Israel, and then you have the house of Judah to the south. Most Christians don't seem to know this. These two houses often fought each other, these two kingdoms. I've heard people even say dumb things like Abraham was a Jew. I've heard that on TV. What nonsense. Jews are from the tribe of Judah, house of Judah. Abraham, you might call him a Hebrew, uh, but a Hebrew is not a Jew. A Hebrew was, in fact, it's interesting, the uh, the root meaning of Hebrew is uh, uh, one who crosses over. We'll talk about that sometime. Not now. I don't have time right now. Abraham, anyway, was Judah's great-grandfather. Judah wasn't even alive. You have to have Judah alive to have a Jew, right? He was the first Jew. So over time, the house of Israel, the northern ten tribes, were taken into slavery and captivity by God as punishment for their sins. In 721, 718 B.C., by the power, a powerful people, warlike people called the Assyrians. They lived at that time. I say at that time because they moved on too in what we now know as Iraq. And because Israel uh, didn't have the signs of their identity, who they were, Israelites, especially having the true God, Jehovah, as their God. And that's why God says so many times, and I, Jehovah, am your God. And you will know that I, Jehovah, or the Lord, it says in your King James Bibles, uh, I, I am the Lord, your God. He wants to know. He wants us to know who our God is. They lost that, and they started worshiping Baal or Baal, as many say, and and all the all the gods of uh, the land. They didn't keep the sign of the seventh day Sabbath, which was given as a sign of his people, and the sign of circumcision. They seem to have so they seem to have been lost to history when they went into captivity, but they're not lost. They moved on, and they finally settled into northwestern Europe and the Americas, Canada, United States, and so on. And then later, about 115 plus years roughly later, the house of Judah was also taken into captivity and slavery to Babylon this time. Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, Daniel, that whole story. But they came back to the land of Judah, Israel, about 70 years later, did not lose their identity. They continued circumcising. They continued uh, keeping the Sabbath. Uh, These obedient ones did. So so, so they didn't lose their identity. They knew they were a house of Judah. They knew they were part of Israel. So all Jews are Israelites. There are 12 tribes that made the nation of Israel. Judah was one of the 12 tribes. So all Jews are Israelites. But not all Israelites are Jews. Just like North Carolinians are Americans, but not all Americans are from North Carolina. Anyway, yes, the descendants of the so-called Lost Ten Tribes are very present with us. I want to move now to Genesis 49 so you can understand what's happening in Afghanistan. Here's when Jacob, an old man now, actually he was sick by this point, and he brings the 12 sons to him, including Joseph and his two sons, And here's what he says in Genesis 49, verses 1 and 2. He says, Gather together, and I'll tell you all what will befall you in the last days. The last days always points to the last days, when Messiah finally returns, sets up his millennial kingdom. Just before that, it's called the last days. Now, if something's going to befall his children in the last days, there must be nations out there. There must be nations out there who are these tribes, but just under different names. So verse 2, Genesis 49, verse 2, Gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob. Jacob was the name before it's changed to Israel. And listen to Israel, your father. There it is. 
that verse one, what shall befall you in the last day, should tell us there are around, there are these nations, there are these people around uh, around the world, on the world scene. It's inconceivable that the Bible would mention Egypt and Iran and other countries somehow leave out the big nations of United States and Britain, Russia, Germany, China, and so on. They're in the Bible, all right. Okay, let's keep moving. Anyway, in the rest of Genesis 49, he tells each tribe some particular things, peculiar things that will identify them in the last days. And that includes most of Northwestern European countries, like I said, Switzerland, Ireland, Denmark, Finland, Norway, Sweden, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Belgium, France, Britain, America. These are the countries I'm talking about. I'm not going to try to prove it today. I don't have time for that today. But sometime in the future, I'll go through it in a couple, two or three sermons. And there are books that you can uh, look up in Google, Identity of the Lost Ten Tribes, one by Stephen with a V, M. Collins in particular, Stephen M. Collins, uh, The Lost Ten Tribes Found or something like that. Look for that book. It's a really good one. Anyway, the greatest of Israel's 12 sons became Joseph. Yeah, that was Israel, Joseph's, uh, Jacob's, I mean, uh, favorite son. Joseph, and God elevated him to be the number two man in Egypt. And he had two sons named Ephraim and Manasseh. We say Ephraim and Manasseh, but it's probably Ephraim and Manasseh, were considered co-equal to their uncles. They were equal tribes. I'll read it to you now. And um, But you can read all about Joseph's promises in Genesis 49. Write this down. You can read it on your own time. Verses 22 to 26. And let me just say, there is no nation that could possibly be Joseph and his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, except USA and Britain, and closely related countries like Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. That was what made up ancient Joseph. They were to be the greatest in the end time. And who is the greatest in the end time? It's America, it's the United States, it's Britain. Okay, especially if they come and, and they always work together. You notice that? They're like brothers. Anyway, um, until the time comes when God himself would make them drop like a rock because they've rejected him. They've rejected, turn away his laws. They've kicked God out of school, government, and, and social discourse and all of that. They've kicked God out. So understand that God is the one who gives us the blessings if we're a God-fearing people and he sends disastrous curses when we're not. But America and the others I've mentioned have kicked God out. So when people say, why is God allowing all this? Are you kidding me? God's not just being a gentleman. He's angry now. He's angry now. And he's sending the curses now. The curses have just started. One of the things God Most High says is that we will lose the pride of our power. Now, let's go to Genesis 48. At this time, Joseph, who was second only to the Pharaoh. If you read the story in Genesis, you'll see what I mean. And he decides he wants to bring his sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, or Manasseh was the older one, uh, to Jacob, to Israel, to have them blessed and meet and so on. Let's read what, what happens. Genesis 48, verses 1 to 6. came to pass after these things that Joseph was told, Indeed, your father, that's Israel, is sick, and he took him with his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Jacob was told, hey, your son Joseph's coming to see you. So he strengthened himself. He was feeling sick, but he got up and sat in the bed. He's an old man by this time, 130-something, 135. And then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said, behold, I will make you a fruitful I'll make you fruitful and multiply you and you'll become a multitude of people and I want to give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. And now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, he reverses their birth order here, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. I want you to understand that. He's taking them as his own. Here's Grandpa saying, I know they're your kids, Joseph, but I need, I need you to understand this. But Ephraim and Manasseh are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, Reuben and Simeon were his, Reuben was his firstborn son. Uh, Simeon was his secondborn son. As, as sure as Reuben and Simeon are my sons, 
your sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, they shall be mine, he says. Okay, that's Genesis uh, 48. I just read verse 5. I'm going to jump to verse 12. So Genesis 48, verses 12 to 16. So Joseph brought them beside his knees, and he bowed down with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim, with his right hand towards Israel. In other words, what happened is, you're supposed to give the first blessing to the firstborn, which would be Manasseh. Uh, but uh, inspired by God, uh, Jacob, Israel, put his right hand, he crossed over to the left side, put his right hand where um, Ephraim was and his left hand on, on Manasseh. That's what it says in verse 13. And then Israel stretched out his right hand, laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. But he blessed Joseph and said, and then he especially blessed Ephraim. So oftentimes, though the firstborn gets the blessing, so often it wasn't the firstborn that God ended up using. David was the eighth one in the family. See what I'm saying? And uh, Isaac uh, was born after Ishmael. Although from the, Isaac was the first and only one from Hagar and so on. But anyway, uh, verse 15, And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Now get this phrase, it's so important. Let my name, this is Jacob who's now renamed by God, Israel, after he wrestled all night, okay? Let my name, that's Israel, be named upon them, Ephraim and Manasseh. Now hold the title Israel. Ephraim and Manasseh, let my name be named upon them and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. All right, so... The name Israel was now moved to Joseph and his two sons. And it was true that when they split up, and the northern ten tribes was in fact headed up by Ephraim in Samaria, by Ephraim. And um, <clears throat> so when the Bible talks about the house of Israel or talks about Ephraim, it's actually talking about all of the ten tribes up north, in many cases, headed up, led by Ephraim. So what I'll end, I'll end with that for now. We'll take time, uh, it'll take, it, but what's going to start happening very quickly in just a few short months or years, America, I don't believe, I don't believe America will ever permanently recover from what's happening and the consequences of it from Afghanistan. And if it does recover from it, I think it'll be illusory, it'll be temporary, it will look like a recovery, but it won't last long. Peace, peace, and then sudden destruction. But just keep in mind that after Solomon's death, you had these two splits, the house of Judah in the south and the house of Israel, the ten tribes, the kingdom of Israel in the north, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. More on that in future sermons. But the pride of our power is going to be gone. Gone, gone, gone. Now, right now, no nation has the wealth, military resources, capability, more power than USA, at Britain and Canada and Australia to that mix, and you understand what I'm saying. That pride, starting now, will be forever broken and nowhere near what it was. Read, please read, Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28. Those are God's words. I want to read a small portion of Leviticus 26. Um, God speaking to America and Britain, and with this shameful, humiliating, awful end to the Afghan war where we're begging the Taliban to work with us, where basically America and its NATO allies have surrendered to this ragtag Taliban who are now armed to the teeth with the finest weaponry in the world. I heard that the Taliban, for example, now has more U.S.-made Black Hawk attack helicopters than Australia has. I haven't verified that, but I can believe that. Plus, we've given them night vision equipment, armored vehicles, thousands of our latest assault weapons, helicopters, aircraft, Bagram Air Force Base, which 
when we just took off because Biden had made the decision to have only 600 Marines left. And so the military understood we can't defend the Bagram Air Force Base with 600 Marines. And so they quickly just got out of there, didn't even tell the Afghanis. But the, the Bagram Air Force Base is the size of a small U.S. city. Think of the city that you live in and its boundaries, and that's the size of this huge airport, military airport. We built their roads, we built their railroads, we built their transportation. Now China can come in and mine the copper and the, and the minerals that they have and get wealth from it. We never did that while we were there. Afghanistan now has more power and equipment than most countries around except China. We have lost the pride of our power. This is humiliating. It's going to get much, much worse. Now I'm going to read Leviticus 26, verses 17 to 21. If you don't obey, and I'm cutting into the middle of where it talks about the curses, I will set my face against you. It's not the blessing that God said for Aaron to pronounce on the uh, Israelites, when he said, thus I will bless them and let my face shine, let his face shine upon you. No, no. My face is against you. You shall be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you shall reign over you. You shall flee when no one's even pursuing you. Leviticus 26, 18. After all this, if you still don't obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins and I will break the pride of your power. I will make your heavens like iron, your earth like bronze. You won't have the rains and all that. And your strength shall be spent in vain. Your land shall not yield its produce, nor shall your trees of the land yield their fruit. <clears throat> then if you walk contrary to me, continue to, are not willing to obey me, I'll bring upon you seven times more pandemics, more plagues, according to your sins. This COVID-19 is not the last one. It was a wake-up call. If you think that's been bad, you wait till the next one. Seven times worse. Seven times more, God says. There are going to be many pandemics coming. You need to be close to God. You need to be praying like you never have before. You need to be trusting Him as never before. You need to be loving Him as never before. You need to be obeying Him as never before. And ask for His mercy and His love and protection. Luke 21, 36 says, pray, watch and pray that you may be accounted worthy to escape these things that shall come to pass. Luke 21, 36, that one was. In spite of God's curses, his own people can remain in peace with a peace of mind. I'll, I'll speak on that in detail in my next sermon coming up, Peace in Troubling Times. Be sure to hear it. Isaiah 26, verses 2 to 6. Open the gates. Isaiah 26, verses 2 to 6. Open the gates that the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter in. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you, on God, because he trusts in you, God. He trusts in God. Trust in Yehovah forever, for in Yah Yehovah, or in Yah the Lord, is everlasting strength. Okay, perfect peace when we look to him instead of looking at what's going on. For he brings down those who dwell on high, the lofty city he lays low. He lays it low to the ground. He brings it down to the dust. The foot shall tread it down, the feet of the poor and the steps of the needy. Are you reading this? Let's read another from the prophet Ezekiel written to the land of Israel. Remember the northern ten tribes, the house of Israel again had already long gone into captivity when Ezekiel is prophesying. Ezekiel himself was a captive from Judah. Ezekiel himself was moved out of the land. Though he speaks of Jerusalem and he speaks of Israel and Judah, the people had all been shipped out by this time. This is a future prophecy. A lot of your ministers are saying this was a prophecy for what would happen. No, no. What would happen? No. They'd already gone into captivity. They'd already been spread out throughout the earth. And so anyway, my point is, when Ezekiel writes what I'm about to read, there was no land of Israel. The Israelites and Jews alike had all been long taken captive, including Ezekiel himself. 
So it's for a future time. And as we read this judgment from God upon Israel, which I believe is spoken today about America primarily, understand that the purpose of all of these spankings from God is to wake us up, to turn us back to him, because he loves us. You know the verse in Hebrews that says, a father who spanks his son is doing that because he loves him. He doesn't want him to keep doing the things that are wrong. He loves us. He wants to turn us back so he so to let us know he lives. He's sovereign. And he is the one true God. He's alive. He's well. He's active. And you, as I read through this, notice the phrase, then they will know that I am the Lord. Then they will know that I'm Yehovah, the living God, the one true God, their only God. There's only other, there's only one name under heaven given by which we may be saved. That's by our Savior Yeshua, Jesus. No other name. Now Ezekiel 7, I'm going to read this from the NIV. I'm changing where it says the Lord sometimes to Yehovah, because that's what it is. The word of Yehovah came to me. Now, who's the word of God? In the beginning was the word. The word was God. The word was with God. The word was God, right? And then John 1, 14 says, and the word became flesh. I personally believe that Ezekiel didn't, didn't just get a bunch of thoughts to start writing. This is a long passage. I think the one we know as Jesus Christ, as Yeshua, appeared to the prophets like Ezekiel many times. Jeremiah had the same thing. The word of the Lord came to me. And just say, spoke to me, came to me. And so in the New Covenant, John, the, the Apostle John, it's all suddenly very clear. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. They were one. Father and son were one. He wasn't the son at that point until he came to earth. He became flesh. Anyway, so the word came to me, son of man. This is what Adonai Yehovah is what it says in the original Hebrew. Lord God. In this case, God is the word Yehovah. Says to the land of Israel, the end. The land of Israel. Remember what I told you. The land of Israel was now the northern ten tribes headed up by Ephraim, which I believe strongly is America today. A lot of you think Ephraim is Britain. But remember, the older son was Manasseh. And the older of the two, Britain and America, the older is Britain. And the younger one is America. And the younger one was to become a multitude of states or nations. When we say United States, the word states can mean nations. Okay? It's where you get all the controversy between the federal government and the state government and the powers of each one. The United States, 50 nations, really, coming together, as prophesied about Ephraim. Anyway, the end has come upon the four corners of the land. The end is now upon you, verse 3, Ezekiel 7. And remember, Ezekiel's in captivity himself. There's no Israel people over there. So it's a prophecy for the last days. I will judge you according to your conduct and repay you for all your detestable practices. I will not look on you with pity or spare you. I will surely repay for your conduct and the detestable practices among you. Then you will know that I am Yehovah. This is what Adonai Yehovah, Lord God, says. Disaster, an unheard of disaster is coming. Remember you heard that on this light on the rock. Verse 6, the end has come to the nation. Okay, The end has come. It has roused itself against you. It has come. Doom has come upon you, you who dwell in the land. The time has come. The day is near. There's panic, not joy, upon the mountains. I'm about to pour out my wrath. I'm on verse 8. Ezekiel 7, verse 8. I'm about to pour out my wrath on you and spend my anger against you. I will judge you according to your conduct and repay you for your detestable practices. Children of God, that's why we want the mark of God on our foreheads that Ezekiel 9, two chapters later, talks about. I will not look upon you with pity or spare you. I will repay you in accordance with your conduct. 
and detestable practices, then you will know that it is I, Yehovah, who strikes the blow. Some people think that all the bad things happening are from Satan. This tells us God spanks, and when he's, God's so patient. The God I know is so patient. He's been so patient with me. But when he spanks, <clears throat> does he ever spank? Verse 10, the day is here, it has come. Doom has burst forth, the rod is budded, arrogance has blossomed, violence has grown into a rod to punish wickedness. None of the people will be left, none of that crowd, no wealth, nothing of value. The time has come, the day has arrived, let not the buyer rejoice, nor the seller grieve. I hope you can make out what I'm saying, my voice is not good right now, it's something in my vocal cords I would like you to pray about. <clears throat> For wrath is upon the whole crowd. The seller will not recover the land he sold as long as both of them live. Be, uh, later here, because of their sins, not one of them will preserve his life. Though they blow the trumpet and get everything ready, no one will go into battle, for my wrath is upon the whole crowd. Outside, verse 15, is the sword. Inside are the plague. And famine. Those in the country will die by the sword. Those in the city will be devoured by famine and plague, pandemics. And all who survive and escape will be in the mountains moaning like doves of the valleys, each one because of his sins. Every hand will go limp. Every knee will become as weak as water. Verse 17. Verse 18. They'll put on sackcloth and be clothed with terror. It's hard to read, isn't it? They will throw their silver into the streets. Verse 19. Buy silver, buy gold, all these ads. Your silver and gold, it says here in Ezekiel 7, verse 19, won't save you. Their sil silver and gold will not be able to save them in the day of the Lord's wrath. They will not be able to satisfy their hunger or fill their stomachs with it, for it's made them stumble into sin. When there's no food that you can buy, it doesn't matter how much gold and silver you have, if there's none. They were proud of their beautiful jewelry and used it to make detestable idols and vile images. Therefore, I will turn them into an unclean thing. Verse 23, prepare chains because the land is full of bloodshed. Cities full of violence. Have you been watching the news about the violence and the shootings and the death and the poor innocents and the blood being poured out in our cities, in Chicago, in Portland, in Baltimore, in Seattle, in all of our major cities? The land is full of bloodshed, verse 23, and the city is full of violence. I will bring the most wicked of the nations to take possession of their houses. I'll put an end to the pride of the mighty, and their sanctuaries will be de desecrated. If you're an evil person, not obedient to God, you can make a place of safety for yourself. God is saying right now that won't work. Our trust has to be in God doesn't mean we're foolish and don't stock up some extra food in case a hurricane comes through or earthquake. But we, we should not have so much stocked up that we trust in that. Verse 25, when terror comes, they will seek peace, but there will be none. Calamity upon calamity will come upon you, and rumor upon rumor. They will try to get a vision from the prophet. The teaching of the law by the prophet will be lost, as will the counsel of the elders. The king will mourn, the prince will be clothed with despair, and the hands of the people of the land will tremble. I will deal with them according to their conduct, and by their own standards I will judge them, and then they will know that I am Jehovah. So what should you and I be doing right now in the coming weeks and months as God's spankings begin? And they're going to begin. It's going to be kind of a bunch at once. What's happening to us now? We have inflation roaring back up. I believe with the 3.5 trillion, it's really more like 6 trillion, that Congress has just passed. 
We are going to see inflation take off in the coming couple of years like you have never believed could be possible. I believe the uh, power of the dollar, which is the world's reserve currency right now. That's part of the pride of our power. You can go around the world with a dollar. The world's going to reject the dollar. It's going to collapse. Mark my word on that. The stock market will crash. I don't know when, but when God hits the pride of our power, I mean, the New York Stock Exchange is going to, you know, affects the whole world. It's going to crash. What you need to do right now, in the coming weeks and months, is pray, pray, pray as you never have before. I actually resigned from my full-time work. I am 68. So I have more time to pray, to study, to work on Light on the Rock. Ask him to let you find him. If you diligently seek me, you will find me. How many verses say that? You need to find him. You need to pray to him lovingly as your Abba, which means Daddy, your beloved Father. He wants you as his child literally as part of his family. Come to know Yeshua like you've never, Jesus, like you've never before. Acknowledge your sins and repent. Repentance doesn't mean just admitting the sins. It means turning around, a change of heart, going the other direction, not keep doing the same things over and over again. Oh, we all still stumble. I certainly do. I'm not yet what I'm going to be, but thank God I'm not what I was. You need to find God. That doesn't mean just going to church. That means on your knees or on your face on the carpet in your bedroom. You, the word, the word worship actually means to bow your head down to the ground. There's so many cases in the Bible of that. I have a sermon on worship. Just put it in the search bar. You'll see what I mean. Ask him to let you find him and for him to be with you and your family. Ask him for protection. Pray for your country. Pray for our country. Pray for your country. I've been praying for Afghanistan. I've been praying for America. I've been praying for the Europeans who are stuck there. I've been praying for the Americans stuck there. I've been praying for the everyday person living in Afghanistan right now. God be with them. My heart cries for them. My heart will cry even more when God's punishments begin to really hit us in this country. And they are coming. So seek your creator as never before. The time of reckoning has started. will unfold in ever-increasing severity for the long time to come. Prepare now. Most importantly, prepare spiritually. But also prepare for being Prepared as you can for empty store shelves. That's coming. No gas at the pump. That's coming. Earthquakes like you've never seen before. Tidal waves like you've never heard of before. Hurricanes in the coming years, you watch, will be devastating. So be ready. I don't let my car go below half half a tank. I don't know when things will happen, when you can't get gas or whatever, and I keep reserve, I keep water reserve, I keep food reserve. But my main trust is in my Father and my Savior. Certainly seven to nine years from now, you're going to be watching a lot of this panning out. You watch. I'm not setting dates. I'm just saying, in, in, Yeshua did say, Jesus did say, for when you see these things happening, you'll know that the time is short like the leaves on a on a fig tree. You know summer is nice. So when you see these things happening, you'll know that the, the time is close when all the things I'm talking about in Luke 21, Matthew 24, are going to start happening. That's what Jesus said. They're happening. The leaves are getting bigger on the fig tree. Jesus is coming back, not in, I don't believe in 40 or 50 years, I believe in less than 10 Maybe nine years, maybe ten. I don't know. 
If it's 15 or 20, that's up to God. I don't know. I can't set dates. I'm not a prophet. But I'm saying the signs seem to be there. And here my next sermon, which is titled something or going to be titled something, Peace in Troubling Times. Let's go to God now. Father in heaven, Yeshua at your right hand, pour down upon your people, your Holy Spirit, come into our lives. Yeshua said that you and he would come and abide in us, right in our very lives by the Holy Spirit. Help us find you, help us seek you, help us trust you. Father, Change us, change our lives in your mercy to be more loving like you, to look like you, to act like you. And we pray for that. We pray that you and your mercy will put a mark and a seal on your children. In your love, you'll protect them from the worst of what's happening. Let us trust you whether you allow us to go through trials and pain and suffering or not. We're going to trust you anyway. Give us the courage and the strength to do that. Father in heaven, oh God, you are so wonderful. You are Father. You are Daddy. Help us to get to know you not just doctrinally but personally. Help us open up to you. Help us talk of, talk of you when we get up in the morning, when we have breakfast, when we have lunch, when we have dinner. Let us thank you for our food. Let us thank you for all you've done for us. Let you be on our mind constantly. May we love you more tomorrow than we do today. May you love us deeper and deeper as well. Help us to hear your words. Jesus said in John 10, 27, I think it is, that my sheep hear my voice. And they follow me. They do what I tell them to do. Jesus, let us hear your voice. Let us be tuned in to you. And act on your words. Love you and know you. We want to marry you. We want to be your bride. Thank you so much. for coming and giving your life for someone even like me and like those hearing this. We've been sinners, but we're turning, we're changing, we're coming to you. We're seeking you. We love you. And we love you, beloved Jesus. We love you. We love you, Abba. We love you for sending him. We love you for all you, you really are. You've been so patient with us. But the time has come that the spankings, I believe, are about to start. Please be merciful to our countries. Not just America, but all of our countries. Please be merciful to all of us. Please guide our leaders. They don't seem to have much wisdom. Give them some. Please, let them do some things that will help us be able to meet in peace. We thank you for our leaders, in spite of their weaknesses, because you're the one who's allowed them to be there. So we thank you. We love you. We trust you. We ask your dismissal now. Yeshua, we love you. In Yeshua's name, amen.